Topic No. 2. Two months ago I revealed that a revolutionary new intelligence weapon was being introduced by Russia. I refer to their organic robotoids. These are man-made, robot-like living creatures, perhaps best described as computerized animals. They are designed to simulate human beings almost perfectly in appearance and behavior, and yet they are not human. Robotoids are so far removed from the knowledge and experience of most people that they are very difficult for many people to believe. But now more and more major surprises are filling the news. That is, they are surprises IF you do not know about Russia's Robotoids. For example, consider the Middle East and the alleged gasoline shortage. Nearly four years ago, on October 12, 1975, I wrote an article on the op-ed page of the Washington Star. It was titled, Who's to Blame for Inflation? It's Time to be Fair to OPEC. The comments I made then are still true today. For example, we hear constantly about the increasing price of oil, but, quote, you must remember that products from the oil-consuming countries to the oil-producing countries are costing more each day." Unquote. And quote, thus oil price rises appear to be limited while the products of the industrialized countries are unlimited, open-ended. Is this fair? Unquote. When I wrote those words in 1975, I was out of step with the crowd. For the next three and a half years we were told increasingly that OPEC, especially Saudi Arabia, was our economic enemy. But suddenly in the past two months everything has changed. The hate Saudi Arabia chant in the major media has abruptly stopped, at least for the moment. Instead, stories are appearing about renewed trust between the United States and Saudi Arabia, and as if by magic the contrived gasoline lines are disappearing with promises of more gas on the way. It's all the result of the Russian Robotoid Shuttles to the Middle East, my friends, which I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 46. Russia stopped the war plan and robbed the big oil companies of their excuse for shortages. Now consider the SALT II Treaty. There is a relationship, my friends, between SALT II and, of all things, the Skylab debacle. There is nothing at all in the major media news about this relationship, but as my older listeners know, SALT II and Skylab are just tips of the same iceberg, and it's an iceberg that is already sinking our ship of state. Earlier. I reviewed how the real story of Skylab's fate began on September 27, 1977. That was the day America lost the secret space battle of the Harvest Moon to Russia. Three weeks later a Russian Cosmos interceptor blasted Skylab out of existence. The real story of the present SALT II Treaty also began on September 27, 1977. That day Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko delivered a speech at the United Nations. By the time Gromyko spoke it was already clear that Russia was winning the space battle, so he spoke very harshly about American stalling on SALT II. He delivered what amounted to a veiled ultimatum. Then he left for Washington for a highly unusual nighttime meeting at the White House with the real Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance. Breathless reporters told the nation there had been a breakthrough in SALT II, but when I recorded AUDIO LETTER No. 26 three days later, I revealed what had really happened. The stories about a SALT breakthrough were lies, cover stories to allay public concern. That's what my listeners heard in AUDIO LETTER No. 26 and for the following year and a half SALT II went nowhere. But early this year 
drastic changes in America's rulership began taking place. For the past six months the AUDIO LETTER has been focusing on these changes as they have taken place, and they have led, among other things, to a turnaround on SALT II. The changes began on January 26, 1979 with the murder of Nelson Rockefeller. That was the opening shot of a secret Bolshevik coup d'etat against America's real rulers. As I have explained in previous tapes, the atheistic Bolsheviks no longer rule Russia. They have been overthrown by a tough band of native Christians. Today Christianity is being reborn in Russia, but here in the United States the Bolsheviks want to create a new Bolshevik Revolution. They want to seize control of America and then to strike back at their bitter enemies, the Christ Ones who now run the Kremlin. For several months the Bolshevik coup d'etat was moving fast. Important people were being purged and replaced by doubles, beginning with David and Lawrence Rockefeller and their intimates. And the weekend after Easter 1979, the Bolshevik purge claimed the lives of President Carter, Vice President Mondale, and their families. But as I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 45, the Russians then began to intervene. A secret war of doubles broke out, and by late April the White House was already under Russia's control. In AUDIO LETTER No. 46, I was able to let my listeners in on the key to Russia's success. They are using robotoids to replace and simulate powerful people. The United States is secretly becoming a Russian satellite state, and the American turnaround on SALT II came fast. On May 9, 1979, the robotoid replacements for Defense Secretary Brown and Secretary of State Vance made the initial announcement. An agreement in principle had been achieved on SALT II, and with lightning speed the treaty itself was signed in Vienna barely five weeks later. My friends, Russia signed with herself through Carter Robotoid No. 3 and Brezhnev No. 2 the human double for the late real Brezhnev. At first the new SALT II Treaty brought howls from Capitol Hill. We heard over and over that it was in serious trouble, but last month I reported the true situation. SALT II's most bitter opponents in the Senate are people who are playing ball with the Bolsheviks here in America. Russia is replacing them with robotoids and the earlier hard line against SALT II is slowly evaporating. The shift is subtle so far, but it is clearly visible. For example, the late Senator Barry Goldwater worried constantly in public about verification. But on July 23, Robotoid Goldwater said, quote, I would not be too exercised over it now, unquote. An even more bitter SALT II opponent was the late Senator Henry Jackson. Jackson always played up the Russian threat, but on July 23 he accused Robotoid Defense Secretary Harold Brown of exaggerating that threat. He called it scare tactics to sell SALT II. Even our outgoing Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Malcolm Toon, is no more. Toon was publicly very suspicious of SALT II, but now a Toon Robotoid has abruptly started campaigning in favor of SALT II, and he won't explain the change. Robotoids, my friends, are a very powerful weapon, but as I pointed out in AUDIO LETTER No. 46, they are also very troublesome. They do not live long, especially under conditions of constant exposure and stress. They must also be programmed, and yet they are also somewhat unpredictable. Last month I described the process by which the holographic brain of a robotoid reproduces the memory of a person being duplicated. 
other parts of the brain are altered, so that the robotoid ends up as a robot-like being that obeys instructions. But the memory includes involuntary responses which sometimes produce unwanted behavior. This is turning out to be a severe problem in the case of the Jimmy Carter robotoids, because the real Carter had mental instabilities which are reproduced partially in the robotoids. The first signs of erratic behavior by the Carter Robotoids came in public comments about Senator Kennedy. The real Jimmy Carter had a strong personal dislike for Kennedy, and on several occasions Carter Robotoids have simply blurted out these reactions in very raw form. To a degree, this type of thing is a danger with all Robotoids. They do not possess truly human judgment. They appear to have it under certain conditions, but this is the result of programming for those situations. The problems of instability and short life cause robotoids to be best suited for interim purposes. For long-term purposes, human agents are still the best. For that reason, don't be surprised to see more and more new faces in high positions. Some of the new faces will themselves be robotoids, but some will be human beings. The Carter crisis of recent days demonstrates two things at once. One is the extent of secret Russian control that now exists in Washington. The other is the difficulty the Russians themselves are having with their robotoids. On July 1, Carter Robotoid No. 4 returned to Washington from South Korea following the Economic Summit in Tokyo. The scheduled Carter holiday in Hawaii was canceled, and the next day a Carter Energy speech was scheduled for the evening of July 5. Then the Carter Robotoid family disappeared to Camp David. Jimmy Carter Robotoid 4 was burning out and was disposed of. Robotoid 5 was next in line and had already been tried out several times. But on the 4th of July, the day before the scheduled speech, Carter Robotoid 5 went berserk. It was disposed of, leaving only Robotoid 6 on deck. Each new Robotoid is given exposure on a small scale first to test its wings, so to speak. For example, our alleged President goes fishing with a few friends or visits a farm family. But this had not yet been done with Robotoid 6 on July 4, so that left the Russians no choice. The speech was canceled without explanation. The Jody Powell Robotoid refused to answer reporters' questions. The press was stunned. Capitol Hill was shocked and dismayed, and Carter's own staff, those who are still human, were caught by surprise. The following evening, July 5, the White House Energy Group held a meeting. Afterward, the Washington Star quoted a key Administration official as saying that, quote, there was incredible disarray." Unquote. Meanwhile, Carter's political advisers supposedly were summoned to Camp David. By Friday evening, July 6, Carter Robotoid 6 was programmed and ready for initial controlled exposure. Thus began the so-called Domestic Summit at Camp David. Puzzled observers said they could not figure out what Carter hoped to accomplish with all this. The people invited to Camp David, after all, were people whose views were already known to Carter, almost without exception. A number of the participants, as they left, scratched their heads in puzzlement. Carter, they said, had talked little. He simply sat taking notes and nodding most of the time. My friends, two things were going on at Camp David. One was the controlled exposure I mentioned earlier for Carter Robotoid 6. But in addition, key individuals among the visitors were robotized. That is, the real person arrived, but a robotoid departed. The individuals who were robotized at Camp David have been identified from Nelson Rockefeller's hit list, which I discussed two months ago. Others were invited and left untouched as a smokescreen. All those on the list who arrived at Camp David are now dead. In their place are Robotoids, K-1 
carrying on in their places like programmed zombies. The people themselves are dead, and the robotoids are not conscious of being alive, and so the secret war of the walking dead goes on. On July 11, Skylab Day according to NASA, the Camp David Domestic Summit ended abruptly. Carter Robotoid 6 had started behaving erratically. Wall Street was rife with rumors that Carter had suffered a nervous breakdown. Robotoid 7 was brought onto the scene, and the next day Robotoid 6 was eliminated. Once again Carter was said to be at work on his energy speech. On Friday, 13 July, journalists who met with Robotoid 7 described Carter as, quote, a thoroughly chastened leader, unquote. Others called him a deeply troubled and worried man. Nevertheless, the next day Carter Robotoid 7 was sent forth to try his wings. Like a dead El Cid strapped to a horse, the seventh Robotoid copy of the late President Carter sallied forth. We were told that the President of the United States visited private homes near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Martinsburg, West Virginia. Afterward, the Russian Robotoid Command in Novosibirsk must have sighed with relief. One of the hosts told UPI, quote, I feel better about him now. He's acting more like a President now." Unquote. That Saturday evening, July 14, Carter Robotoid 7 arrived on the White House lawn by helicopter at roughly 6.30 p.m., but the Russians were taking no chances. An Associated Press dispatch that evening described another unexplained strange turn of events. Quote, Members of the Press Corps who normally are allowed on the lawn to see and photograph the arrival were barred from doing so on Saturday. White House press officials gave no reason for the change except to say they saw no reason for the coverage." Unquote. The following evening, Sunday, July 15, Carter Robotoid 7 successfully delivered the long-delayed energy speech. But as it turned out, energy was only part of his subject. In that regard, the Russian program to nationalize the big oil companies was set in motion. That is what the so-called Energy Security Corporation is actually all about, and to cut down all bureaucratic obstacles to Russia's energy plans here, the Energy Mobilization Board is to be created. But the speech had a much broader thrust, dealing with the crisis of the American spirit. Some commentators have joked about the speech as Carter's Sunday night sermon, quote, unquote. But as I will point out briefly in Topic No. 3, we would be wise not to laugh, because, my friends, the words of the Carter Robotoid 7 came straight from the Kremlin, and the Kremlin is not joking. Even the speech itself was not without its mystery. The following day an article in the New York Times pointed out, quote, Another extraordinary development was that the White House had no advanced text of the speech, the President's ten days of deliberations notwithstanding. It was the first time in the memory of veteran reporters that no prepared text was released." Unquote. Even so, the speech gave the impression momentarily that things were finally back to normal, but that impression was shattered less than 48 hours later. Shortly after 4 p.m. July 17, the Jody Powell Robotoid issued another brief surprise announcement to reporters. Something unprecedented had happened. The entire Carter Cabinet and all senior members of the White House staff had offered their resignations. Once again, the Washington establishment was shaken to its foundations. But if the resignations were a shock here, they were a lightning bolt overseas, because in other countries the resignation of an entire Cabinet means just one thing. It means the government has fallen. For the next few days news reports worldwide were filled with worried reactions. On all sides we were hearing words like dismay 
bewilderment, disbelief. Senators and others described Carter as acting erratically. One said publicly, quote, We are worried about him having some kind of breakdown, unquote. Another said, quote, I think the President is nuts, unquote. Soon a Jimmy Carter robotoid may well flee the White House. That will leave 1980 as the year of the Dark Horse, because as of now every major potential Presidential candidate has been replaced with a robotoid. Two months ago when I first made public my intelligence on the Russian robotoids, I gave a warning. I knew many people would find them unbelievable, but I also cautioned that, quote, events in the days ahead will be impossible to understand without knowing this secret." Unquote. And now, my friends, those events are already taking place. <laughs>